Hey there, happy Wednesday. It's day 7,558 of the pandemic. Um, luckily, it leaves me lots of time to do demos. This one is from Cleared In, uh, which provided this software again, free of charge. Again, never used it before, no training, jumped in and just sort of figured things out. Um, I think there's a lot of value in doing that, showing that these systems are usable. Uh, and then a lot of the way the software is going now, you don't have to have a PhD in the product to do the work. So buckle up, strap in. These things only take about 10 or 12 minutes. I think you get some good information, if nothing else. Um, if Maybe you just get to see me stumble around and try and figure some stuff out. Uh, but we're doing phishing. Uh, we're looking at email inbox security and a social graph, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, and we'll go forward from there. If you like these videos, subscribe, because there's more coming. <music>
Uh, I'm just working off of my knowledge of Neo4j. I don't really know what all this system is, but I, I'm guessing the nodes is uh, a link to sort of show who's connected to what, where. Um, the green, I'm assuming, is someone that is a validated connection. Yeah, it looks like that's right. And if I look at the links, I can also see the interconnected nature of what's going on between users and emails. Now, here's me, which obviously this is my account. I would have the largest number of connections to others. Uh, and I can actually increase the scale a bit so we see who's talking to who more often. Kind of nifty. Um, like, let's go look in maybe the past month. Uh, okay, past. Whoops. Now let's go past week. So you can see, you know, here's me uh, emailing folks that I email. Um, you can tell the connections there. And I'm guessing because they're all green that that means that those connections were trusted and okay. So if I saw a red one, that would be the problem I would be probably uh, really worried about. Uh, because I had them send me a, a phishing email, let me show you what that looks like within the email inbox. I think they actually came across. Now, this is the test that they sent me with a tagged phishing uh, link. But the interesting thing that I found about this was from the perspective of securing the end user and not allowing them to you know, become infected, you've got Gmail system, Google's security on top that's already there that's probably taking care of a large swath of this uh, potential malicious phishing emails. But you've got this system, which is tied in that as well, working via APIs and those other connections. Here you can see that this is tagged as a fish and it says mark as a fish. Yes, I mark this as a fish. Mark it as safe um, or mark it as spam. Now, because I'm doing that uh, or looking at those analytics, I can kind of see, OK, the link says it, it's good. Uh, and the real URL is Forrester.com and the domain is Forrester.com. OK, bad link uh, tied in there as well. You can see that bit.ly. Uh, if I can get it to come in, the bit.ly expands. So obviously what that means is that is a, a compressed URL thing hidden inside of that email. So that's where your click link, oh dang, I downloaded this thing or I downloaded or clicked on something I shouldn't have type of action would occur. And then danger words. Well, this is one of a very common set of words that's used in phishing emails of, uh, you know, payment invoice. Now what they're basically saying is in their analytics, Anytime they see something that says security and also has the words payment or invoice in it, that that is a yellow or potentially malicious. So you can see, you know, yellow, red, green. This is what's triggering this as a, you know, more likely a bad. Uh, but the, the interesting thing here is I can't even click. I can't reply to it. I can't forward to it. I can't. There's nothing I can really do here. Um, I can. You know, filter it, delete it, block it, report spam. But the stuff that I would do, reply or forward, which would be where the problem would come in of spreading this with other folks would be, um, uh, it's not even allowed. So mark it as fish. Now it's marked as a fish. It's going back into the system and doing its thing to make sure that that is updating and, and sharing that information across their user base. So this is kind of like crowdsourcing uh, security as well. Um, what, but again, the thing I think that's most useful here is you see what's good, what's bad, and then why this was probably a problem. And I'm not allowed to reply or forward. So it's one thing if I happen to get infected myself, but it's another if I go further down a rabbit hole and infect other organizations, other individuals because of that forwarding reply type of situation. Now, if I go back here to my dashboard and look at the incident, you can see that now that email is gone. Uh, and what's basically happened is I got the email. I went through the process. I said that it was a fish. All that it's done is basically said from here till whenever we're going to say that anytime that that system uh, or that email shows up and has those things within it, it's tagged as a fish. And by default, they're going to block it. So, so we're training the ML on the back end to actually uh, take care of that problem for us, which is good because then I don't need to worry about somebody clicking on it because it never gets to them anyway. If I'm looking in the domain side here, you can see that there's uh, quite a bit of uh, communications between domains. Um, essentially, what I could do here is go through and tag things as, you know, unsure, untrusted, trusted. 
Uh, I'm not going to do that because this is just a demo, but you could go through this and you could say all the emails that come from Forrester.com are trusted. Anything else is unsure and you're tagging it and you're updating the system and you're letting the system sort of know that. But one of the sort of factors that you could use here is you could actually say, well, let me score these and see as you score, it says unsure, trusted, trusted. You can also look at the DKIM, which is going to be based off of the mail servers and the communications that are there to kind of sync up and, and uh, look. I would personally filter this more off of the number. Um, usually what you see with you know junk emails and phishing emails is going to be more of a high number of domains showing up. Uh, that's usually because they're just trying to get those through. Um, Twitter, probably not. It's Twitter. Uh, I use Twitter, so whatever. Um, some of these other ones would be ones that might be of concern for me. Also going through and looking at the contacts, uh, you can kind of see who's sent, you know, most emails, who's received. Obviously, this is my email account, so Chase Cunningham. Um, these are other folks that I've, you know, worked on my Sinji comic book with way back in the day. Um, most of them don't even exist on, on that domain, but they're still there. Uh, and you can t tag them as trusted, untrusted, unsure, that type of thing, so that you're building up a uh, an email list of folks that you're okay with sending email back and forth. There's no reason to run um, analytics on some of those when they're inside of a hardcore trusted domain. Now it's still going to check for phishing content, but you're basically saying, I trust my communication with my partner, Heather, or something like that. Now here's your suspicious emails. Uh, you can see pretty clearly, you know, the phishing emails, you know, there was a Slack message, AJ was that other one. Now the Slack one should obviously pick up pretty quickly because I don't use Slack, never have used Slack. Uh, but you can see that it someone somewhere tried to send me some phishing emails with a Slack connection. So the system picked it up, did what it's supposed to do, game on. Uh, and I can use these, export them to Excel, which a lot of people like them in Excel sheets. Uh, I can also go check the suspicious side and look at all these suspicious ones and say, hmm, are these suspicious? Are they not? There's going to be a lot of them because, again, this is just a junk email. User side, here's how I enrolled all my users. Uh, I thought this was kind of uh, an interesting one I read about it was basically I can go from different modes of silent, which is basically just saying, look, I'm going to do analysis and sort of send you notifications of, hey, this is potentially a problem, whatever. I can do alert, which is I've run the analysis. Here's the problem. Don't do this thing or there's protect of, I don't trust my users to not click links because my users are, are you know known to click. So I'm gonna protect and by protecting, it just says, you can't click this, you can't do anything with this. And it's just that simple of moving it from one toggle to the next. And it tells you right here, you know, what those are. Protect, educate users about why it's suspicious, protect by locking suspicious messages, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the other things that I think is kind of neat uh, within this and it makes life a lot easier, especially having been a red teamer and having done phishing ex ex tests, is I can go through here and I can actually run a phishing scenario against all of my users with one click. Um, I don't have to go off and configure a whole bunch of other things. I don't have to go off and, uh, you know, make a whole bunch of changes and set up individual emails and whatever it's all here i can i can connect it and run it you know here's a template now these are just their basic templates obviously i could go through and create my own you know pretty pretty cut and dry uh you send it it's going to wind up doing what the phishing email does and if they click it they'll get it uh, essentially you know here's a dropbox very easy that one works pretty well a lot of times in phishing scenarios other couple of things that are useful in these types of systems, and again, this is bolting on to, and why I said sort of the platform side of it is bolting on to G Suite or O365, you can bolt in to the file sharing side of that. So if I wanted to bolt in my Google Drive or Box or Dropbox to all of these accounts over here, I could literally do that. And what we're doing there is we're almost doing uh, an upgrade on the DLP system from G Suite, and we're saying, look, we're only going to allow certain connections to occur. We will only take in files from these emails that we know that have been validated and trusted. And you're able to do that for everybody in your team and do that uh, very, very quickly. And it's all done, again, via the API. Um, I, I, I'm not going to do this because I don't feel like setting it up right now, but I can see this being pretty useful in the context of enabling that follow-on uh, security side. You know, Health Check is uh, this little... Uh, extension here let me find um yeah so there's my cleared in 
extension. So basically what that is, is that's where it's working with the browser and it's doing its thing to check all of these uh, domains and URLs and things as I transit the internet and maybe try and click on something. It's not acting as a browser isolation, but it's basically uh, a plugin that I'm using for, for those purposes. If I don't, from what I read, if I don't have the Chrome agent, uh, the Chrome extension installed, I can't do the file sharing. So if you're gonna use the file sharing side, you would want to have the extension installed really simple install click you know run no problem uh, easy to do this is kind of useful as well um, if you have slack uh, which a lot of organizations do um, i read up on this from their site basically uh, i don't even know if this is going to connect up because i don't have slack but um, basically what you're doing is you're allowing this system to look inside of slack itself the messaging platform not the email platform and process the messages that are bouncing around in near real time to keep you from clicking on links inside of slack which is pretty innovative from the perspective of um well i hadn't necessarily thought of that i know that's a common tactic i know that if people can get into your slack channels they could cause those types of compromises but um, this perspective makes a heck of a lot of difference so very interesting way of tying into the messaging channel i'm not sure if they're tied into some of the other messaging platforms that well, enterprises typically use, but you know, Slack is here, which is a very popular one. You know, here's the file sharing stuff. Again, I didn't enroll my file sharing, but it's it's pretty easy to do. Uh, the suspicious outsiders thing is actually kind of interesting. From uh, if somebody showed up that was trying to share files or was trying to access files that I didn't know about or wasn't in my trusted graph, then you would be able to say. Well, first contact, when were they there? What files are they going after? Who owned it? And then tag it and go forward from that system. And then lastly, you know, on the phishing test, you can see, you know, I, I, I sent one email, just kind of fired it off to see what was going on. Um, pretty simple uh, system. I haven't run a whole lot of campaigns. Again, I haven't um, spent a lot of time in this. This is more of just a familiarity side of it. Here's your templates. You can create a new one. I was messing around with this blockchain uh, template the other day just to say, you know, let's see if we should get this on the ledger because people like clicking on blockchain things and, and reading about it. So I thought maybe I could grab some folks there. You know, it gives you the um, ability to modify text or HTML within the, the file itself. And then you can add other things in a tracking image. So uh, from if you've ever run a phishing test and you've done this, you know it can be pretty uh, long and sort of obnoxious to sell that stuff up here. It's all inside of the platform itself. And then uh, last thing really was being able to change the sending profiles and sort of say, okay, well, I want to make sure that, you know, it comes from this particular email address. You know, it looks like from Chase Cunningham at the Sinja cleared in, blah, blah, blah. Here's what it's actually going to go through. Uh, certificate error is going to be handled. If you've ever run a phishing test, and you've sent through some of these things, you'll notice that the certificates can get checked and then you wind up with weird errors and fail outs and it's just more of a problem. Um, <clears throat> but it makes life a lot easier to send this at scale. I can imagine if you were doing this for, you know, 30,000 users, how, how uh, labor intensive that would be in here, having it all click, click, done would make things easier. And the fact that it's all integrated with O365 and G Suite where all your users' accounts and admins and everything else are tied in, means you're just clicking and firing it off and going forward from there. So again, quickly, this was just a, a run through on protecting the user's inbox, whether it's G Suite or O365, um, bolting in another system that works via API to use ML on the back end to train the engine for phishing emails, for bad content, being able to hook into Box, Dropbox, and those types of file sharing things, and then also going into Slack so that you could take care of the messaging platform itself. Uh, and we're doing it through G Suite. I ran you through kind of what this looks like for the end user. You know, here it is again, and the protections that are offered there. So in the context of enabling ZT, this is the type of solution that fits well into that position because the user um, is protected without having to do much. The deployment process took maybe 90 seconds uh, and setting it up as the admin was, mm, oh, maybe 15 to 20 minutes worth of work. Thank you.